150 for Connor McDavid. Over the course of the NHL timeline, we've seen significant fluctuations when it comes to goal scoring and point production. Whether it's because of rule changes, advancements in technology such as skates or sticks, the evolution of goaltending stances, or perhaps a cultural shift due to the fame of a star player. Each era in hockey has had its own stories. Great players who dominated their era, but because of these scoring fluctuations, the scoring leaderboard can be a bit misleading. Now, what do I mean by that? On this graphic, we have the average goal scored per game, per decade from the inception of the NHL up until today. And as we can clearly see, there has been massive fluctuations when it comes to goal scoring in the league. And from face value, does an extra goal per game really make that big of a difference? If we just say there was 32 teams who play an 82 game schedule, this would total to 2624 games. And if we compare the 80s scoring to the goals per game average of the 2000s, we are talking over 2000 extra goals scored per season. Over 26,000 extra goals scored in a decade. So when it comes to the scoring leaderboard, an extra goal scored per game is a massive difference. If you dominate it in an era of low scoring, it truly speaks volume. For example, let's take a look at Sidney Crosby, who'd score 109 points in an era where the scoring was down, and then compare that season to the 80s, Crosby's adjusted scoring would be closer to 150 points. Now again, with rule changes, expansion drafts, it is impossible to truly compare eras. But point adjustment does in fact provide much needed perspective. <laughs> During the inception of the NHL, we would see two players rise to fame, as Cy Denneny and Howie Morenz would both gain prominence. Cy would have the most success winning five cups, but Morenz was seen as the greatest in the game, the GOAT, as Morenz was a level above everyone else in terms of skill and scoring, as he would be the first player to record 50 points, 40 goals in a single season. And keep in mind, there was only between 44 and 48 games in a season, where Morenz would take home three hard trophies and three Stanley Cups. In his best season, Howie would put up 28 goals, 51 points in 39 games. So when we adjust this total to the scoring we are seeing in the modern day, he was on pace for 138 points. And in the first two decades, Howie Morenz was seen as the greatest of all time. In the 1940s, we would see scoring exponentially rise, as it would go from 2.47 to a record high 3.2 goals per game. Cue Maurice the Rocket Richard, as this man would revolutionize the limits of goal scoring as he was the first player to score 50 goals, 70 points, and this man would bring home 8 Stanley Cups. He would be the only player to eclipse 250 goals in the 40s, and not only was he revolutionizing goal scoring, but his skating was putting the league to shame, hence the nickname, The Rocket. Mashard's best season, he would score 50 goals, 73 points in 50 games, and it would adjust to 101 points. And given the NHL's increase in popularity, which would in turn lead to increased competition, Maurice Richard at this point was considered to be the greatest of all time, as he would end up taking the all-time scoring title in 1953. In the 1940s, heading into the 1950s, we would see the introduction of Gordy Howe, Mr. Hockey. And Howe is called Mr. Hockey for good reason, as he would have arguably the most prolific career in NHL history. As Gordy Howe's rookie season was in 1946, two years before Bobby Orr was born, where Howe would then proceed to play 32 years of professional hockey and retire in the same season as Bobby Orr at the ripe old age of 51. Like seriously, Think about the optics here. From the time Howe was a rookie, up until his final game, there had been zero players for over a decade who he faced off against as a rookie. Hell, when Gordie Howe was 27, nine years into his career, he would have two children who were Mark and Marty Howe, where he would then play on the same team as his kids at age 51. 
And not only was he on the roster, but he was still a great player with 15 goals, 41 points. As Howe would be the first player to score 100 points, and he would capture the all-time scoring record by a mile, on top of winning four Stanley Cups, six Art Ross, and Hart trophies. But here's the thing, in 1973, Howe would make the shocking decision to leave the NHL to join the WHA. And I mean, let's be honest, the guy was probably paid out the wazoo, but if he didn't leave, he would have ended his career closer to 2,300 points, 1,000 goals, and 2,200 games played. And again, 2,200 games played? That is absurd, as many NHL careers back in the day didn't even last a decade. Immense physicality that would deteriorate countless players' bodies. Gordie Howe's longevity was truly an incredible feat, and if he didn't leave to join the WHA, his games played record wouldn't be touched, wouldn't even be sniffed. As not only was Gordy Howe the best player of the 50s, but he would surpass Maurice Richard as the undisputed greatest of all time. His adjusted scoring would equal to about 143 points, just shy of Connor McDavid. In the 1960s, the NHL would begin to see exponential growth. As not only did we see a big jump in the number of superstars, with guys like Bobby Hall, or perhaps John Beliveau, who late in his career would climb the scoring ladder, but we would see the introduction of six expansion teams. So when there are six glorified minor league teams, it of course leads to an increase in scoring. And in the 60s, Bobby Hall would separate himself as the most dominant player in the era, as this man would win four Art Ross trophies, and get this, seven Rocket Richard trophies. And of course, a Stanley Cup, as he was the first player to score more than 50 goals in a season, which would lead to a 7-minute standing ovation in Chicago, as Bobby Hall was known for his blazing speed, hard shot, and blonde locks. And not only that, Hall would revolutionize goal scoring, as him alongside of Stan Makita would popularize the curved blade. If you want to see a video on stick technology and the story behind this, go check out this video down below. And in 1966, Hall would put up an astounding 50 54 goals, 97 points, and 65 games. And with a modern adjustment, this translates to 127 points. With that being said, Gordie Howe was still considered the GOAT. In the 1970s, we would see a head-to-head -head battle between two all-time greats, who also just happened to be teammates, as Phil Esposito and Bobby Orr were a clear level above their competition. But here's the thing, Bobby Orr was the first defenseman in NHL history to even sniff the title of the greatest of all time. And even though Phil Esposito would win five Art Ross trophies in six seasons, on top of setting the new single season scoring record, with 76 goals, 152 points, what Bobby Orr did as a defenseman in a time where offensive defensemen were basically non-existent, easily places Orr not only as the best player from this era, but the greatest player in NHL history. As Orr would win eight Norris trophies in a row, Two Art Ross trophies, three Hart trophies, four Stanley Cups. In 1971, Orr would put up an astonishing 139 points. I mean, come on. Leading up to the Orr era, the best season we would see from a defenseman in terms of scoring was 50 points, in many seasons, 30 to 40 points. 139 points would set the defensive all-time single season scoring record. A record that still stands today. Adjust that to today's scoring, and it equals to about 145 points. As Bobby Orr didn't only rise to the greatest player of all time, but he would revolutionize the role of a defenseman, and that he was the first quarterback-style D-man, similar to players like Adam Fox, Quinn Hughes, Kale McCarr, and that every single play started on his stick. Whether it was the breakout or on the power play, Bobby Orr orchestrated an offense like no other player. Not only that, my goodness is skating, would increase the limits to what fans and players thought was even possible. Like seriously, imagine if McDavid played against competition who were 10-20% slower. This was the dominance of Bobby Orr, as the man would skate laps around his competition, and if it wasn't for his bad knees, which would lead to early retirement, Orr would have finished near the top of the all-time scoring list. So we got a new GOAT, Bobby Orr. In 
the 1980s, got wild as we would see the highest goal scoring averages in NHL history at well over 3.8 goals scored per game. And this goal scoring uptick would lead to countless superstars around the league. Like seriously, and if you follow these teams, don't comment. But have you heard of the name Neil Broughton? I have never heard this guy brought up in a hockey conversation before. Who the hell is Neil Broughton? A man who put up 105 points in 86. Who is Joe Tonelli? Another man who put up 100 points. No disrespect, of course, but Neil Broughton and Joe Tonelli have never graced my eardrums before, not even once. And they were putting up totals that would have broken records just a decade before, as this goal scoring outburst would all culminate to the 1985 season. Because get this. There was 16 players who put up 100 points, 22 players at a point per game, and 60 to 70 players who were at 70 points. Like, let's think about this for a second. 20-25% of all players had a 70 point season. These numbers were mind blowing. And many players such as Marcel Dion, Guy Lafleur, Brian Trottier, Mike Bossy, Kent Nielsen, all deserve honorable mentions. However, in the countless goals scored in this era, Wayne Gretzky would separate himself not only from the competition, but he would become the unanimous greatest player of all time. The GOAT, 10 Art Ross trophies, 9 Hart trophies, 4 Stanley Cups, he would be the first player to eclipse 200 points in a single season, and he would quickly take over the all-time scoring record. Check out this infographic from Hockey Rankings. I'll link the full video down below if you're interested, go check it out. But as soon as as Wayno appears on the graph, he would leapfrog over everyone including the great Gordie Howe, as Gretzky so stands today as the all-time scoring leader. A record I don't think will ever be broken. With that being said, if we adjust this scoring to the modern era, will it still be as impressive as Wayne Gretzky would have his best season in 1986, where he would put up, you know, just a nice 215 points, and Gretzky's adjusted total is 172 points. Hmm. A lot closer to McDavid than you would think. In the 1990s, Gretzky's dominant reign would be followed up by the next phenom, Mario Lemieux. Because after putting up, and I'm not even joking, 133 goals, 282 points in his draft year, Lemieux would be slated as the next generational star in the league. And by no surprise, he was exactly that. 6 Art Ross trophies, 3 Richard, 3 MVP awards and 2 Stanley Cups. And the best way I can describe Lemieux's complete and utter dominance is by taking a look at the 1993 season. Because in this season, Lemieux would put up 69 goals, nice. 160 points in just 60 games. And if you're wondering why he missed 20 games, well, after putting up 104 points in his first 39 games, Mario's season would be abruptly stopped, as he would be diagnosed with Hodgkin lymphoma, a deadly cancer that was surely going to end his NHL career. However, the moment Lemieux finished his final radiation treatment, the man would hop on a plane to return to the NHL season, where he would put up 56 points in the final 20 games. Like seriously, he was battling a serious illness to start the season well on pace to surpass Gretzky's single season record. He would return from radiation only to score at an even higher rate as he was on pace for 220 points that season. And if you compare this to the modern totals, it would equal to 187 points. And based on this, there is a serious argument that Mario Lemieux is the greatest player of all time. However, recurring injuries, cancer treatment, which would lead to an early retirement, unfortunately means that Lemieux can't be considered the GOAT. If you think he is, I definitely understand the argument, but as it stood, Gretzky would hold all the records. And even though Mario Lemieux had a great career, he's still one of the biggest what-ifs in NHL history. After two decades of record high scoring, defensive structures and the development of the new age goalie would culminate to the late 1990s as we would enter the dead puck era, a period in hockey history with record low scoring. With that being said, we would still see numerous stars rise to fame. The Auger, Sakic, 
Dazzlant, Tromaginla, were all scoring as if they thought F the Dead Pog era. And if you specifically look at scoring, you'll see Joe Thornton and Jerome Aginla on top of the leaderboard. I would even say Aginla was the best forward of the 2000s, considering his Rocket Richard seasons and game-breaking physicality on a team without a lot of help. And if you adjust his 2002 season, where he scored 52 goals, it would translate to a 63 goal season. I also think it's important to bring up Ovechkin's 65 goal season in 2007, where if we adjust this to the highs of the 80s, it would equal to about 88 goals. But considering Ovi and Crosby came into the picture in the late 2000s, I decided to put them in the 2010s era. With that being said, Nicholas Lindstrom was hands down the top player of this era, as Lindstrom would win 6, 6 Norris trophies in a row, 7 total, 4 Stanley Cups, playoff MVP, as Nicholas Lindstrom is hands down the most complete defenseman in NHL history every time this man touched the ice. His playstyle was perfect. He didn't have a single flaw. Skating, puck skills, he had the top offensive game and shutdown game from a blue liner in this era, on top of being a great theater. In 2000, Lidstrom would put up 20 goals, 73 points in 81 games, which would adjust to 84 points in today's era. With that being said, Wayne Gretzky would of course still be considered the GOAT. The late 2000s, heading into the 2010s, we would see the emergence of two generational stars, Alex Ovechkin and Sidney Crosby, with honorable mentions, the Zedines, Patrick Kane, Eric Carlson. But with that being said, Sidney Crosby would separate himself as the best player of the 2010s. Three Stanley Cups, three Hart Trophies, two Finals MVPs, two Rockets, Ted Lindsay's, and two Art Ross Trophies. However, we would see an incident. In a time where Crosby was reaching new heights in his prime, he would suffer several near-career-ending concussions. And in 2011-2012, we would miss out on one of the greatest seasons in NHL history, as Crosby would come out of the gate on fire, 37 points in 22 games, during a time of low scoring. If we adjust this total to today, it would equal to 157 points. Now again, like Lemieux, this is a big what-if. But considering this season, culminated to Crosby's prime, 157 points was not a far stretch. With that being said, Crosby would miraculously get his career back on track. We're at the age of 36. The man is still on a 50 goal, 90 point pace. So Crosby may not be the greatest of all time, but he made it pretty damn close. If he's able to play into his 40s, he's currently on track to finish right around Mario Lemieux on the all time scoring list. Oh, beautiful wheel around move. Oh, and scored! We have seen several superstars, generational talents rise to fame. Whether it's Austin Matthews, who is outpacing Alex Ovechkin for goals scored in the same games played, Kill McCarr, who is looking like the modern reincarnation of Bobby Orr, or perhaps Connor Bedard, who is set to be the next face of the league. The 2020s has been a treat for us fans, and this has coincided with an uptick in goals scored per game. Factor in increased power play opportunities, I expect scoring to continue to rise. The star of the 2020s without a question has been Connor McDard. Mc <laughs> Connor McDard. Connor McDavid. Because at the age of 26, the man has five Art Ross trophies, four Ted Lindsay's, three hearts, and a Maurice Richard trophy. All he is missing is a Stanley Cup. And last season, McDavid would reach a new level with a modern high 64 goals, 153 points. But here's the thing, because we're in the 2020s, if we instead adjust his totals to the scoring totals of the 1980s, it would equal to about 198 points, which would rank him as the third highest scorer in NHL history. As McDavid has set a new bar for how to combine speed with amazing puck skills. But there we have it. 
And based on the adjusted scoring leaders, here is the final result. Regardless of whatever era, Gretzky has hands down been the most dominant player in NHL history. With the rising scoring in the NHL, on top of an influx in power play opportunities, is 170, 180 points truly out of the question for McDavid? I don't think so. 160, 170 isn't. So if Gretzky's adjusted scoring translates to around 170 points, there is a legitimate chance that Connor McDavid takes over the title as the greatest player of all time. The brand new, guaranteed graded card box has just hit the stores, where you have great odds of pulling a PSA 10 Kill My Car Young Guns. If you don't pull them, there's still a bunch of other great cards, and every single box comes with a sealed hockey product. If you want to support the channel, go check it out down below, and as always, thanks for watching.